Welcome to the very first episode of A Table for One, a secret critique production podcast where, whereby I'm essentially just going to go through what I'm watching in terms of TV and movies at the moment and the games that I'm playing. So without further ado, let's begin. And I'd like to start first with The Blacklist Season 5. Now, The Blacklist is obviously in its fifth season now, and I was a watcher from the beginning of Season 1, from when it aired, here in the UK on Sky One. And I watched the first four and a half seasons and I got to about season four, episode eight, and I took a break. I took a back seat from the blacklist because I just felt it was getting too repetitive. A lot of the answers that I kind of wanted from the very first pilot episode weren't being given to me. And it was kind of going through this same format and there was a lot of filler episodes in my opinion. So I took a break from the backlist, and it wasn't until just a few weeks ago, really, that I saw season five had started, and it was getting some good reviews, Um, I had a couple of friends who were watching it, and I thought, I need to get back into this, I need to get watching the blacklist again. So I found out where I was, I was on, yeah, literally about season four, episode eight, and I got back into it, and boy, I have not looked back. The blacklist season four, well, the latter half of season four anyway, really, really pays off. The questions you'd been wanting the answers to since the pilot episode are answered, okay? James Spader is absolutely phenomenal. The main reason why I watch The Blacklist is for James Spader. His character, Raymond Reddington, is just fantastic. The way he manoeuvres through situations, just his dialogue, his demeanour is, is just brilliant. And he's a really, really great character with lots of depth. And his relationship to Elizabeth is really built up upon. And at the start of season five, we find a Reddington that we're not familiar with. We, we've had four seasons of this massive criminal empire that Reddington kind of, at the click of his fingers, summon you know battalions of men and get things done. But at the beginning of season five, we see this different Reddington who's literally been reduced to nothing. And I don't want to go th- into many of the spoilers from season four, because the reason why he's in this situation, obviously, is because of the end of season four. But essentially, Reddington is living in a motel. Now, I've only seen the first two episodes because they've only two have aired in the UK. I think they're Tuesday, Sky One, about 9pm. So I'm looking forward to episode three next Tuesday. But nevertheless, he's, he's, Reddington's literally living in a motel and he's kind of building up his empire from scratch almost. But he's still got that wit and sophistication whilst, you know, he's had to sell his suits. You know, there's not so many fedoras in season five so far. We're still getting that brilliant wit and sophistication of Reddington just in a different format. And the show is really brilliant. It's almost had a revitalization, like come back to life. And you've got your same characters, you've still got the FBI task force, and they're still very much working with Red. But you've got this another layer to the relationship, especially with Red and Elizabeth, and they're really working together well. Dembe's also in season five as well, another character, and he's actually got a lot more speaking lines, even just in the first two episodes. And they've they've kind of added some humour to his character as well, which I did like. So that's brilliant. So I'm watching The Blacklist and really, really enjoying it. And that is my first mention for this week's Table for One. But as well as that, in terms of games, over Christmas I bought Middle Earth Shadow of War. And it's a game that I missed. I was a very big fan of Shadow of Mordor, which obviously came out, I think it was about 2015, I think the game came out. Correct me if I'm wrong there. But Shadow of War was basically innovating upon everything that was brilliant in Shadow of Mordor. And Shadow of Mordor was a real innovative game because it took, okay, it took a lot from other games. It took the parkour from Assassin's Creed, for example. It took Eagle Vision, this kind of thing. But then it had the lore and it had this brilliant nemesis system and that's what really sets the game apart from, say, other games, other open world kind of RPGs, Assassin's Creed, like that. It had this nemesis system whereby you can dominate orcs. And in the first game, it was kind of quite primitive. But in Shadow of War... It's really brilliant, and the reason why I didn't get it at launch is because I was kind of put off by this idea of microtransactions and these kind of things. But essentially, Shadow of War was a brilliant game, and I've sunk for at least maybe 15, 20 hours into the game already. And whilst there's a kind of third act where you're really, really grinding, which I haven't quite finished yet, I must admit that I haven't got to the final conclusion yet because I've been doing a lot of other things, building up orcs. Orc armies, because that's the difference between Shadow of War. You can build up orc armies as opposed to small captains and and, and small gatherings of orcs. And it's been really, really good. There's been some predictable twists with the lore, but even characters like Gollum and Shelob, they're a lot more prevalent in this. I don't think 
I don't think Shelob was in Shadow of Mordor, but you've got characters like Shelob then, for example, that are in it. Gollum's in it a lot more, I found. He was in quite a few missions, and instead of just interacting with him in cutscenes, he's actually in the game, and you follow him around segments like that. And there's some good things. There's also returning characters from the first game, and brilliantly, the Nemesis system, I don't know how they've done this, they've, they've able to link the Nemesis system so that orcs that you fought in the first game actually return in the second one. And there's, there's some story-based things with that, with orcs obviously you couldn't really control, but really, really brilliant. And the mechanics work really well in this fortress capture and defend. So you, cap, you build up your armies, dominate orcs, and then you can attack and capture fortresses. And then once you've got these fortresses, you've got to obviously defend them against Sauron's forces. And there is a kind of online element where you can tackle other players' fortresses, and I've done a bit of that because you needed to for some tutorials and rewards, etc. But most of the time, I've just played through the campaign, and Shadow of Mordor has really been innovated upon. All the mechanics from that game have returned. I mean, there's massive... The skill tree is almost overwhelming. You've got so many things to unlock, and with each skill, there's then three optional upgrades, which you can... Up you know, you can choose to add on and develop the skills, but overall it's been a really surprising game, and I'm glad I got to pick it up in the end. Um, with the PlayStation Store sale, I've been able to pick up the DLC for Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, Frozen Wild, so I'm really looking forward to playing that at some point. And then other than that, I've got Doom VR, which I need to play at some point. I actually went back and I've done some of the Playlink games um, with a few friends, which have been really, really good. In fact, Knowledge is Power and That's You. <laughs> Both actually really good fun over Christmas, especially with family and friends. Um, so I really like that. And, you know, everyone's got a smartphone. It's not like you need... It's, it reminds me of Buzz on PlayStation 2. You don't. You never needed those loads of controllers, always having to ask mates to bring around controllers. You don't need that anymore. Everyone's got a smartphone nowadays. You literally download the app. Most of my friend, you know, most of my family friends would delete it afterwards. But you just download the app, and then you know you're allowed to play through that brilliant thing. And Hidden Agenda is another one that I want to try. I haven't actually got it, but that's definitely another one that I want to try with the play link. And then obviously VR, I've gone back and played Keep Talking, Nobody Explodes, which is one of my favourite VR experiences because it's, it really brings out teamwork. Funnily enough, you've got people work out. You know, we've got printed manuals. You've got one on the screen. And you really work out who's good at what different puzzles, and you try and solve them. And there's a real competitive element there, even amongst your team. You know, you want to get this puzzle solved the best, and who's really good at the code breaking, who's good at the Simon Says. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible game. It's not like anything I've played before, and a few of my friends as well haven't played on PSVR before. And so just going to be their first VR experience is quite, quite overwhelming, really. So that's really great, and that's kind of where I am with gaming. Last but not least, then, in terms of films... Over Christmas, I also uh, downloaded and watched Transformers The Last Night. Now, I missed this film in the summer of 2017, and I've always been quite a Transformers fan. I quite like the first two films. Uh, you know, I had all the toys as a kid, and I enjoyed the games, etc. But this two-and-a-half-hour-long Transformers was a disappointment, if I'm honest. The director Michael Bay seems to favour... Mark Wahlberg, the main character and the human character, seem to get more screen time than the likes of Optimus and Bumblebee in the Transformers that we actually know. As well as that, Transformers that we actually know, there's not many of them in this film. In fact, Optimus, who's probably the best character, he's probably the best, best Autobot, he's the best character in the Transformers franchise, is on screen for about three minutes. He's on screen for about three minutes, and he, he's fighting Bumblebee in one scene, and that, that's, that's the bit in the trailer. That's the bit that we've seen in the trailer. So that was really underwhelming, and from that perspective, it really disappointed me. Um, the special effects are obviously fantastic. They're brilliant all the way throughout the film. And the film has a great sheen of polish, but it's just the, the story and the narrative. I mean, it, at the end of the film, it looks like they're going to make another Transformers, but... I know certainly that perhaps this is Michael Bay's last one, and I, I don't know contractually what's happening with the Transformers franchise. But it was just a disappointment. Um, out of, as I say, the other things I've been doing over Christmas, you know, the Blacklist, as I've aforementioned, mentioned, and Middle Earth Shadow of War, it was amongst the most disappointing of the thing, of the media that I've consumed. And with that disappointment, I'm bringing to an end the first episode of Table for One, uh, a Secret Critique podcast. Now, this is obviously the first podcast uh, production that I've ever really done. Uh, I don't have much on-screen content, you know, there's not pictures flashing around like in some of my other videos and reviews. And it's kind of the first time that I've really gone off script and just kind of said what I really think about things. A lot of my other videos, I do script things. So I'd be really interested to know what you think about this content. Let me know in the comments below. 
but ultimately thank you very much for watching for listening in this case um, and i'll see you on the next video thank you